politicians, and celebrity guests. Get ready. It's time for Pinal Power Players. It is 1230. I am Douglas Wolf, your host of Pinal Power Players. Welcome, everybody, to a hot, and I mean white hot, day in Santan Valley. We have a very special guest. I want to get right to Doug Ducey, the founder and uh, uh, man who built uh, Cold Stone Creamery to the mega giant success it is and then sold it and went into uh, state politics and became the state treasurer and has been a very successful state treasurer for us here in Arizona and now is a candidate for governor and uh, running in a tight but fun race with uh, a host of other champions who are trying to get that spot. But uh, Doug is my candidate for this election. So, uh, Doug, are you there? I want to get started with you right away. Thank you, Douglas. Thanks for it having me on and i'm here fantastic uh i just saw a news release that said something about the brian terry family i think our audience ought to hear that right away yeah we're really excited and, and honored douglas we had brian terry's sister and uh i think your listeners will remember brian terry was the porter agent who was murdered uh during the scandal of fast and furious and i was asked to speak at a dinner in his honor earlier this year in Tucson, and I'll tell you, it'll really bring our border issues to life when you uh, get to sit with his mom and his sister and see what these families have been going through, and uh, his sister stepped forward and said she wanted to endorse our campaign for governor, so we've uh, we've got a commercial that's uh, starting today, and Katie Pavlich uh, from townhall.com and Fox News wrote a nice article about it, and it's all on our website at duckducey.com or Facebook, Doug Ducey, or uh, at Twitter as, as well. So we're excited about that, and we certainly feel an obligation to everyone who's being affected by the border issues. It's really become an issue in this campaign, uh, Douglas. And uh, in, in addition to Brian Terry's sister, Kelly, you know, we also just were uh, endorsed by Utah United States Senator Mike Lee, who really is the Tea Party senator, came to uh, into office by wiping out an establishment candidate and has been making great inroads back in D.C. in terms of constitutional conservatism. So we're really proud of the broad, broad coalition we're building, and we're thinking it's resonating with voters, and we're creating some separation from this very crowded field. Well, and that's what, you know, it's what's great about the Republican Party is we do have and believe in competition. No one was handed this. No one was made the the heir apparent as the next uh, governor or anything like that. We, You know, you got to go out and win it in the Republican side as opposed to the Democrats, which just clear the field for whoever they want to be the favorite. And uh, that's what's great about the Republican Party. We believe in competition and free enterprise. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that border issue. That has become the number one issue. And and uh, I see that one of your competitors is going to build a Patton's Wall or something. And there's all kinds of talk out there. And um, and the reason, of course, it's, it always resonates with, it seems to me, resonates with Arizona voters is because we're uh, we're in the heartland or in the in the right in the crosshairs, I should say, of where the most egregious crossings occur. And yes. you, you've been addressing it, but I think our audience today would like to hear where you are on, at, you know, from, from the basics. Let them all know what, what you would do as governor. Sure, and this is a very real issue in this campaign, and especially in this state. I think all of us would agree that the first job of the federal government is to protect its citizens. And by any measure, Barack Obama has failed Arizona and specifically uh, America on this. I mean, we have a border that is wide open and unprotected. And my thinking on this really crystallized, Douglas, at that Brian Terry dinner when uh, Sue Krentz was the honoree that night. And your listeners will remember Sue as uh, the wife of Bob Krentz, and Bob was murdered at his southern ranch. Uh, Sue stood up at the podium and asked, what has our federal government done since these tragedies have occurred? And there was just silence in the room. And she leaned in, um, and, uh, and the comment was made, uh, they have put up signs in the desert that there are dangerous people among us, and if you see them, call 911. So they put all the action and all the cost back on the state so what I've said is I'm for all of the above, whatever it takes approach, whether that's more fencing or new technology or that we restructure DPS funds so that we have more 
support of our county sheriffs and county prosecutors where this crime is happening. We need to aim at drug cartels and human trafficking, and that's the, the maximum amount uh, that the state can do in, uh, to, to go after this, this issue. And it's something as governor I'll be aggressive on. In 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 looking at that issue uh, in in past, uh, the issue the issue has been well, what can the state do? And specifically, you've got some uh, things that you said we know the state can do X, Y, and Z. And uh, I know you just kind of went through those, but what are what are our limitations? What can we do that we're not doing? Well, this is the first thing I want to say is I really want to applaud Governor Brewer on this. She signed SB ten seventy in 2010, and this nationalized this issue, and we had captured the attention of the country. And again, what has our federal government done? What has our leadership in D.C. done? What has uh, what has Barack Obama done? They, they haven't done anything. So before we would ever check this off the list, and I do think there's a, a time where we could say, okay, we've got a, a, a secure border. I mean, that's that's our objective as, as a country. I mean, that's how you def- uh, have a, a, a def- definition of, of what the, the line is of what you can cross and where we begin and where another country begins, who we want to partner with economically. But w- we need some participation from the federal government to get this done. So what the governor can do, what I say is I'll do everything legally under the governor's power, and that would include all law law enforcement assets, including Department of Public Safety, including working with county sheriffs and county prosecutors. And in certain situations, you can also uh, uh, bring in the guard, and and, and I'll do that. But I'll also look to work with our federal government, uh, and in two years, we'll have a new president. And hopefully, there'll be someone who takes their oath of office seriously and says that they want to defend the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We're living in a post-9-11 world, and our Tucson sector is wide open and unprotected. And so we're being failed by our leadership in the White House today. Now, you were probably just in uh, junior high school in 1986, because I'm a little bit older than you are, uh, <laughs> Doug. But in 86, uh, in 86, well, we want a young, vigorous leader for this state, and you're it. Um, and in 86, I was just a, a, a married and just had a couple of kids that were very young. And Ronald Reagan, who's kind of an icon of the conservative and Republican parties, or conservative movement in the Republican Party, signed on to a very generous, I think three million people were legalized uh, as a citizens who had come across illegally with the concomitant promise that the, the border would be sealed. And of course, we all know the story there. And I think it seems to me uh, 11 million more illegal uh, citizens, or not citizens, illegal, 11 more illegals later, fully once, you know, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, or whatever, however it goes. How uh, we, how can we trust uh, the government, the federal government, when they haven't lived up to what they've done in the past? That's I think most conservatives ask the question, and that's why they don't support having, a, a, even though Jeff Flake's on and John McCain is on, don't support having a federal law passed because they don't think they'll do it anyway, so why even go through the motions? Well, it's so much more than just a law. It's the action of, of the federal government, and I agree with you. I mean, I, was, I spent 25 years in the, in the private sector, in the, in the same world your listeners are in, the, the real world. Uh, my company was Cold Stone Creamery. Uh, you know, the government wasn't there to help small ice cream owners who, uh, who want to sell waffle cones and create a good experience inside the store. And I've just seen this erosion of trust in our federal government. And so I do think that this is an issue, but this is where a, a border governor, like the governor of Arizona, can be a spokesperson and a leader. I'll reach out to, uh, to Rick Perry in Texas, or their likely next governor, who's Attorney General Greg Abbott. Uh, we've, I've met and visited with both of them. Uh, I've met and visited with uh, Susana Martinez, who's the governor of New Mexico. And I don't have much hope that Jerry Brown will want to work with us. But I think that the governors who live in the state and have to deal with the citizens, you know, they can't hide back in Washington, D.C., can be uh, the ones that will offer out what the definition is of the right actions and physical structure and technology that allow us to look at citizens and say, hey, we know who's coming and going. And you can't say that today, Douglas, and that's why there's no faith in the federal government, because we've known this for well over a decade, and nothing's been done. It's Yeah, it's very interesting. And, and I understand there are 
the activist groups who think that, you know, leak reconquista, this is really should be a part of Mexico. And, you know, that there's this, that's the extreme left on that think that because we took it illegally or whatever. Uh, that's, that's baloney. And, and we, we know that's baloney. And, and let's, let's talk real world. We've got a, we've got a border. We need to, to secure it. And, uh, I think we should be, we should be proud. You know, it's, it's what Gene Kirkpatrick said. It's time we start telling the truth about America. Uh, no matter how pleasant it is, uh, this is a great place to live. There's a reason people are coming across that border because we've got a better quality of life here. I, I, I love the fact that we, uh, that people want to come to this country. Uh, and we are a nation of immigrants. But first, we're a nation of laws. We need to enforce the law. And that's why they want to come, because there are, a lot of them are escaping lawless, uh, totally out of control, uh, plutocratic or tyrannical governments. So it makes perfect sense to me that I'd want to get out of there, too. But again, you got to do it the right way. And that's only, you know, to me and, and everyone else, I think, on, on, the, on our side of the issue, that seems just like common sense. You have to come in through the front door, not the back door. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, 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 Doug Ducey, who's our, our candidate here for governor, everybody out there who's listening, this Doug is on with me for a short period of time because he has a really uh, compressed schedule as we're getting down to the next week, uh, the early ballots go out. Um, everybody's interested in Common Core, especially every the uh, primary voters in Arizona. Please give us your take on Common Core and what you would do day one as governor. Well, I'm opposed to Common Core. Uh, we don't need Common Core to educate a child in, in this state. And, boy, education is one of the things that animates my campaign. I've got three sons of, of my own. I think the quality of life in our state is going to be contingent on what these children are learning when they're in school and in too many places we're underperforming in the state. We need to raise expectations. We need to reward our teachers. We need to get more money in the classroom. We do know how to educate a child in the state. We've got three of the top ten high schools in the nation, but we don't need Common Core to do it. And so a juicy administration will, will lead with high standards. And I'll tell you one of the first standards I'm going to have. I'd love to see this be my first bill. It's the American Civics Project. It's the 100 questions that any new American who comes into this country legally, it's the test they take to be granted citizenship. Douglas, it's 100 questions that all of your listeners would pass this test. It's how many United States senators are there? What do the 13 stripes of the flag represent? Why are there 50 stars in the standard? These aren't partisan questions. They're not ideological. They're just core knowledge about what makes America unique, different, and special. Uh, less than 4% of Arizona school children can pass that test. And it's even worse in Oklahoma, less than 3%. So if Doug Ducey is elected governor, no high school student will graduate or receive a diploma until they pass the American civics exam, and then we're going to work, of course, on the fundamentals of reading and writing and comprehension and analytics and all the other things that should be happening inside a, a, a school. Uh, we don't need Common Core to do it, but we can lead the nation in outcomes and improvement of K-12 education and options for, for parents to choose where their kids go to school. We're going to lead in parental choice as well in this state. Yes, I understand that you were heavily involved or, or as uh, with the charter school movement in the state of Arizona. Would you like to expand on that activity? Sure, Douglas. Yes, I sat on the state charter school board. I'm also a regional board member or past regional board member for Teach for America. And, and both these organizations are really the solution. One is about school choice, which allows competition into the market and has allowed us to have some of the finest schools in the world right here in our home state. And then the other thing, Teach for America, this really is, it's any organization, it's about the people. So if we're focused on the children, the kids that are sitting in the seats, and that should be the first priority, then the, the next most important issue are the teachers, who we put in the classroom. I've got a, a, a 10-year-old of my own. He just turned 11, but he just completed fourth grade. I mean, his fourth grade year was contingent on who his teacher was in the classroom. And where Sam Ducey goes to school, it's not perfect. But it, they have good teachers in the classroom. And if for whatever reason they're not good, well, that teacher's going to be trained up and she's going to be good by semester. And if for whatever reason they're not, there's a new teacher in the next semester. And so that idea of committed principals who will lead their, their schools and make personnel decisions is, is important. And it's, you know, this is fundamental to anything else we do uh, in, in, our, in our country. 
any other organization is about leadership and people. It's the same in K-12 schools or charter schools or even Catholic or private schools, for that matter. That's what makes the difference. We need to do that in our K-12 schools that are underperforming, and we'll have astounding results. Let me ask you a hard question I, I've asked the uh, Frank Riggs and a couple other candidates who've been on, and it's a partnership, really, in schools with it's the school, and, and as you mentioned, the, the excellence of the instruction or the people given the instruction, the leadership, and you know all those elements. What do you do, and, and I'm not saying you have the answer today, but the, there's a lot of parents who are disconnected from the process, let's say 25 to 30 percent, because that's our dropout rate in the state. Have you thought about that and what maybe we can get to do is get those parents to say to their kids, hey, it's important to you that you do your homework. Hey, it's important that you graduate. Is there anything in, in your mind that you think that would get those, those folks moving towards a better life for their kids? Well, sure. I think we have to do everything we can do uh, along with that. And you know, what I've done is, and this is what I've done throughout my career, is to reach out to others who are experts in this category and say, what, what do you do to overcome these obstacles? We had Dr. Chad Gaston of the Camelback High School on one of our telephone town halls. Now, Chad, this is a tough place. I mean, 91% free and reduced lunch. So high poverty area, a lot of issues around families. But Chad has invited the parents in. He's engaged them. He's told them what their role is in their, in, their, in their child's success. And in some of those situations, Douglas, I mean, the situation is there may not be a parent who cares. There may not be a parent who shows up. And the way Dr. Gaston handles that is that somebody at that school is going to care for that child while they're at that school and love that child and make sure that that child knows what's expected of them in their studies. So as much as I wish that every kid had a wonderful home life and a two-parent loving family, we know that's not the reality of our society today. But that should be no reason for us to say that that child shouldn't go to school and learn to read and learn to write and learn to add and learn what makes our country special. And I think if you have that, that core value of a relentless pursuit of results, when a child is inside that school and you let them know that you expect them to learn and you care about the outcome and what they do with their life, we can make a huge difference. And if we have a mom or a dad at home or in many cases both, even better. Well, I, you know, I think that's the missing ingredient and I, it, because there are, there are a lot of concerned parents who do, uh, you know, focus on their kids' homework and focus on a relationship with the teacher in the school. It's, and, and we can make those things better. There's no question, and Common Core is not going to help us do that. It's just a, it's just another federal government program that you know everybody thinks, oh, it's money and it's testing and all that. Um, it's not this. There is no silver bullet. I think that's one of the illusions. It, 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 yeah, the you're uh, right. The, the education there's community. There's no silver bullet. It's yeah. work. We tried no child left behind uh, under Bush, and and you know we've had fads since 1984. Terrell Bell and the Nation at Risk uh, way back under Reagan. So. Um, but yeah, that the engaging the parents, uh, and if they're not there, then we've got to find a way. And you can't, you know, pass a law and say, okay, you're all going to be concerned now or caring. I mean, it's a it's a it's a structural thing. And and anyway, I want to explore it with you because it's not something. It's not a question get gets asked all the time on the campaign trail, and that's why I want to ask. Um, let's jump to another topic because I know your time is limited. I'm on with Doug Ducey, our next governor of Arizona. In my opinion, um, Medicaid expansion happened last session. We had some uh, Republicans cross over to support the governor and her budget, along with the Democrat majority, or became the majority with the Democrats. Your take on where we are with Medicaid expansion and what's going on with Obamacare and the effect it'll have on the state of Arizona for the next, you know, four or five, well, eight years when you're governor. Let me be perfectly clear here, Douglas. I am 100% against Obamacare. It's a monumental failure and a rolling disaster. I really believe that America needs to break out of Obamacare before Obamacare breaks America. I believe Arizona can lead the way. We do have an issue with what the governor and the legislature have done. We've got this three-year guarantee from the federal government, which concerns me. I think we need to remember what uh, uh, our favorite conservative said about the federal government. Uh, and that was, you know, be, be careful about getting uh, in bed with the federal government. You might get a little something more than just a good night's sleep. And uh, that's going to happen uh, under the watch of the next governor. So the real opportunity for the situation we're in at the state level is reform. 
at the Medicaid level and the opportunity at the national level. And I think while we still have an opportunity to take the United States Senate in 2014, um, my, my hope would still be for repealing and replacing uh, Obamacare because it's certainly going to only put costs back on the state. And I'll do everything possible underneath the, the governor's direction to be vigilant in, uh, in our state, living within its means and protecting our budget so that we don't burden the taxpayers of the state of Arizona. I, yeah, it's going to be, uh, now that it's in place, uh, and supposedly 9 million people have signed up, My and in my understanding of the numbers, of course, I don't believe anything the Obama administration puts out, but it's heavily weighted towards expanded Medicaid as opposed to the quote-unquote 40 million who are uninsured which was a false number anyway, but this is going to be an ongoing battle. And the recent Supreme Court decisions this week, now we have one federal court that says only the states can offer the uh, subsidies and the other, um, the other appeals court uh, or federal district court said no. Uh, it, forget what the language of the law says just because they wrote it wrong. We know what they meant. It's going to go to the Supreme Court, which will have a, a big effect because if only – if only the states can offer subsidies, which we are part of now, as I understand it. I think that's where we're in. Is that right, uh, Doug? Yes. There's The, the way they uh, they sold this thing through, if that's the right word, or, or just shoved it through, was so perverted with things like the uh, corn husker kickback and uh, other things that were done. That, you know, th- this law has not rolled out, Douglas. This law has been given waivers and exemptions and delays and executive orders. No, as unpopular as Obamacare is, it is not yet rolled out. The president has made political decisions since he was able to, uh, through rescission, get, get this uh, through the United States Senate when the entire country spoke in the special election in Massachusetts uh, for Teddy Kennedy's seat, and they put a they put a red Republican inside blue Massachusetts named Scott Brown, turned it into a national election, and it was a it was a flare. It was a clarion call to say, "Stop! We do not want this law." The president shoved it through anyway, and this is what we're dealing with. Yeah. So okay. So the next our next governor has to be firm on it, and it's going to be pushing back. Square that with with the. Uh, and I was told by the people who did cross over from the Republican side and voted for it with the, with the governor's uh, push that we do have a proposition in, in this state that we have to uh, supply medical care or medical insurance to, you know, a certain segment of the population that, and I don't know the exact percentages and so forth. So the, his thinking or their thinking was, hey, we have a, a state proposition, which means it's the law. We're not following it now because of the budget crisis. What? How do we fill the gap if the Medicaid thing were were to go away, and if if the Obamacare is overturned, we still ha- do we still have that obligation in the way you see the law today in Arizona? Well, well, when uh, when the voters pass a law, it's the politician's job to follow the law, and part of our our Medicaid, which is really um, a, a social safety net for the destitute, the disabled, the the the, the poor in our state. And yes, of course we'll follow the law, and of course we will uh, provide the benefit to this, these people. But we also want to provide opportunity to these individuals so that where we're able, they can re-enter the workforce and begin to climb the economic ladder and have uh, the quality of life that, that they, they want to have. So uh, Obamacare obstructs that. Obamacare does not make that easier, and I think we have a system today that's obviously not working. It's becoming generational in terms of its welfare, and in in many cases, I believe it's paying people not to work. So that is not working for our economy. It's not working for growth and prosperity, and a juicy campaign is going to be about kick-starting our economy and providing opportunity for all. And, uh, and getting out from underneath the thumb of the federal government with some of these top-down, one-size-fits-all programs that don't work and won't work for our middle class are not going to be part of my administration. Well, that's terrific. And that was my now my next topic was business climate in Arizona. We still haven't recovered all the jobs we lost from the downturn in 2008. Uh, we've done some things to uh, raise our competitive level with other states and so forth. 
tell us what your top two or three priorities would be to make us a more business friendly state in and bring in outside businesses and homegrown and grow some uh, locally grown companies. Well, I think first and foremost, our business climate has got to be the most attractive in the country in which to do business. And we've got that opportunity to do that here. You know, part of my uh, decision-making process to run for governor was going around and talking to other governors about what they did right in their state. One of those was Rick Perry. They've got a better tax code in Texas. They've got a lighter regulatory environment. They've got what's called Texas-style tort reform. So it's lower liability and litigation on the small business person and the uh, and the citizen. So I want to do that. We can move all those forward in the first year of a juicy administration. And then the other thing is just to pitch, just to sell Arizona. You know, we don't have to talk companies into leaving California, Douglas. They're leaving by the hundreds. Uh, we're already Chicago's favorite suburb. So instead of those companies going to Indiana or to Colorado or to Texas, Let's pitch Arizona, and we'll get many, many more uh, than our fair share of headquarter offices. Fantastic. Well, uh, I've been given the uh, high sign that you've got to get on to another event, which we really appreciate you taking the time in this really tight uh, last few weeks of the campaign. Please tell us uh, why you should be the next governor of Arizona and how people can join your campaign if they're interested in what they hear today. Well, thanks so much for having me, Douglas. I really appreciate it. Uh, I built a company. Now I want to shrink a government and grow an economy. And if you like what I'm talking about, I'm asking you to join our team. We've got less than six days until early voting, and I'll bet that many of your friends and neighbors don't even know there's an open seat for governor. It's the first open seat for governor we've had in the past 12 years. So if you want to know more, go to DougDucey.com, at DougDucey on Twitter, or DougDucey on Facebook. We've got a lot of good news and information, and help me spread that news. You know, it's more important what what you say about me, Douglas, and what your listeners say about me and what I say about myself. It looks like these other campaigns are pulling up the garbage truck and trying to drunk trash on uh, on what so far has been a a winning message. So, and I also want to say thank you to you, Douglas. Uh, It's been great getting to know you through this process. Um, And I want to work with people like you and other thoughtful conservatives who understand our principles and uh, and where they came from and bring them to light in a really positive, optimistic message. I think it's important to remember that we live in the state of Barry Goldwater, who really gave birth nationally to this movement we embrace called conservatism. And uh, I'm thankful for what you're doing. Help me spread the good word, and I hope to see everybody out on the campaign trail. Thank you very much. Godspeed and good luck, Doug Ducey. We look forward to uh, January and you putting your hand on the Bible and being sworn in. Thank you, Douglas. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Well, everybody, that was Doug Ducey, a candidate for governor and in leading the pack right now as the uh, the candidate uh, so far that in the polling, if the polls can be believed, is a uh, front runner by just a little bit. And when you get to be the front runner, one of the interesting things that happens is everybody wants to come after you. And, of course, that's what's been happening with his campaign and uh, a lot of stuff going on that, um, you know, uh, is part of politics nowadays is uh, if you can't say anything good, uh, don't say it. Make every, make sure you say everything bad. And um, and so everybody's taking shots at Doug Ducey right now. And uh, that's just the way it is. And so let's take a uh, top of the hour break uh, for our advertisers who we appreciate very much here in Santan Valley. I am Douglas Wolf, your host of Pinal Power Players. And if I can get my little mouse to work, we can uh, get our ads to run. Here we go. Hi, Marie here for WannaSing.com. Are you looking for professional DJ or karaoke services for your next holiday party or get-together? WannaSing.com can provide the best in sound, lighting, and a professional MC to host your next event. Whether it be a company party, birthday party, wedding, or any occasion, WannaSing.com is ready to provide the fun and make it a night to remember for years to come. Call 480-664-8801. That's 480-664-8801. Mention this radio ad and receive a special discount for your next fun event. WannaSing.com.
When you visit Hill Family Dentistry in Santan Valley, dentist Dr. Tim Hill provides each patient with personalized, gentle care that you deserve. Our entire team is dedicated to providing you and your family with services that will make you smile. With a full range of general, cosmetic, and specialty dentistry services that will keep you and your family smiling, our commitment to our community is to provide outstanding oral health. Hill Family Dentistry is located on 36359 Gansell Road in Santan Valley, diagonally across from Banner Ironwood Hospital. Evening and weekend appointments available. We accept most insurances and have in-office policies available for non-insured. Contact us today at 480-588-8127. Hill Family Dentistry. Are you ready to start taking control of your future and maximize your earning potential? Central Arizona College has smaller class sizes and personalized attention to help you compete in today's tough job market. CAC now serves Santan Valley and Queen Creek. The CAC Santan Center is located in the shops at Copper Basin on Hunt Highway behind Barrow's Pizza. Stop in and see how taking classes at CAC costs a fraction of a state university and your credits can transfer. So if you want to earn real money, you need to learn real skills at Central Arizona College. Enroll in classes today by calling 480-677-7825 or visit www.centralaz.edu or call 480-677-7825 or visit www.centralaz.edu. Central Arizona College, your college, your way. Well, welcome back. It is two minutes after the top of the hour, one o'clock on a Friday. And I guess I'm just listening to the ad for uh, CAC, uh, the um, campus. Location has changed. It, it, if you heard in the ad that it used to be behind uh, Barrow's Pizza down on Han Highway, and they have opened their brand new campus that's all on Bella Vista. So I'm going to have to ask uh, our major domo, Joe Carrero, out here at the Carrero compound uh, that uh, Marie will have got a new ad for the um, Central Arizona College to put them in the right spot. I am Douglas Wolf, your host at Pinal Power Players. Next week on Friday, we will have Jeff DeWitt. Uh, he is the th- uh, third candidate in the running for state treasurer, and whoever wins the primary, which is very interesting, um, will be the next state treasurer. The reason is the Democratic Party has failed to put up a candidate, which kind of hard to understand. Uh, you know, I mean, if you're a major party, usually you try to put somebody in every slot regardless of your chances of winning. And uh, they have not done that. So uh, the winner of the primary will be the next state treasurer. And we've had on uh, Hugh Hallman, and we've had on, um, uh, okay, I'm drawing a blank, sorry, Randy Poland. And so now we're going to have on Jeff DeWitt next week. And Jeff's a very fun and interesting guy. So uh, I hope you tune in to listen because he, you know, he's one of the three. And if you can believe the polls, and I always say that with a strong sense of, uh, of questioning, um, he is right now uh, leading a little bit in the polling, uh, so we'll see what happens there. On the 8th, we're going to have on Darla DeWall, uh, not Darla DeWall, I'm sorry, Diane Douglas. For those of you who are really interested in Common Core uh, as being something that would be bad or is bad for the state of Arizona, um, the school superintendent uh, or state superintendent of schools race is between John Hoopenthal, who is an incumbent Republican, and Diane Douglas. And uh, John Hoopenthal has been in government a long time. He's a sharp guy, and but has unfortunately got himself in a little bit of trouble, not only because he's portrayed as the promoting or really supporting Common Core, which in a way he has to do because his job demands it. And on the other hand, Diane is saying, no, we can, we can stop this at the superintendent level with the cooperation of the gover- governor and, and the state legislature and so on. So she has uh, stormed into the race and has a very strong chance of upsetting an incumbent Republican, particularly because Mr. Hoopenthal said some things that were, let's say, uncharacteristic and not, uh, not well filtered for a political candidate. And you can look him up if you want to find out what he said about people who are against Common Core. Um, 
One thing I want to talk about that happened in Pinal this week is I like to give the rundown, and this is an issue that resonates across the country, is the death penalty. And we had uh, in Florence, we have the prison, and we have a uh, the death row for the state. And some um, one of the people who should have been put to death a long time ago uh, committed to a double homicide in 1989. It took this long for the courts to decide that, yeah, he's really guilty, and yeah, it's about time we uh, demand the ultimate penalty from this person did take place. And because the there's a strong anti-death penalty uh, movement in this country, uh, they have done everything they can to make it so it's, first of all, homogenized, so that it's, you know, that it's not, we're not shooting people anymore in a firing squad or hanging them or anything like that or using the electric chair. Now we're, we're just medicating people to the, into the death penalty, which in my opinion is a mistake. Uh, because now they're attacking the sources of the drugs and the companies who make the drugs, and and you know they're using all these legal roadblocks to try to stop executions. Now, I understand the other side of the coin. They don't think it's right to take anybody's life. The state doesn't have the right to do that. My argument has always been, yes, but a citizen forfeits those rights when they take another citizen's right because that's the ultimate rights you have as an individual is your right to right to life. And... Yes, there are times where there's ambiguity, and there have been death penalty cases where you know there could be questionable whether or not they deserved it, or they actually were the guilty person. Although I don't, I've never seen proof in the United States that someone who was who went who under who uh, ha- went under the death penalty or was was executed was actually found to be innocent after the fact. I don't know of any. I may be wrong, but I haven't seen any. The point is, this guy, uh, there was no question. He walked into his uh, girlfriend's father's body shop. Pulled out a, or didn't pull out a gun, but waited till the guy got off the phone. He turns to talk to him, and this criminal turns and uh, shoots him in the chest, kills him. Then goes looking for the daughter, which was his love interest, who she had dumped him, and his ego and his, you know, his male whatever couldn't take that, so he had to kill the father and went and killed the daughter. So there was no doubt about who did it or whether he's guilty. And all these legal niceties about, well, you know, he was insane or he was only 80 IQ or whatever. Or it's worse to sit in prison all day. This is, uh, this is one of the arguments I hear. First of all, you could, uh, you could make the argument that anybody commits a murder in that way is crazy. Okay? But in my opinion, if you're, you're crazy enough to do the crime, you're crazy enough to, to, do the pen, to uh, suffer the penalty. The other thing is, uh, you know, the, the rich uh, left... And the well-educated left in this country seems to think the worst possible thing that could happen is you sit in a little box for 23 out of 24 hours a day, and that's where you're going to be the rest of your life. Well, that's what they call in that in psychology is projection. In other words, they could not stand the idea of being locked up all day in that type of a situation. However, there are a lot of people, Richard Speck, who, was, who killed eight nurses in Chicago and lived on the taxpayer's dole or dime for, I don't know, 30-some years at least. You know, he said, hey, I had a great time in prison. You know, he had plenty to eat, a place to sleep, and, of course, he had lots of recreational partners, if you know what I'm getting to, in prison. So he, he felt or he thought it was just, you know, hey, I, I can deal with this. You know, he would rather have done that. Than, and to him, the death penalty was a much, much worse uh, pen, uh, uh, you know, would have been a much worse penalty than having spent life in prison, getting living off the taxpayer, and basically, uh, you know, flipping the bird off to uh, the rest of society, saying, "Ha ha ha! I can, I can be a, a, a huge predator, kill eight different young women, snuff off their lives, and I get to eat and breathe and and do that for the rest of my life." So, uh, I, I just can't buy it. I like I said, I, I wouldn't want anyone be executed who wasn't as guilty as the guy was that we put to death this week. And uh, for those who think it's terrible and we're going, you know, we're barbaric and all that, if you ask me, it's more barbaric to have 1.2 million abortions every year. And this is one thing that the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, they always put out what, you know, what are the main causes of death every year in the United States. And it's about 500,000 from heart disease, uh, 450,000, give or take, from cancer, and then drops off from there, different different things. and But they never put out the number one cause of death that's preventable, absolutely preventable, is abortion. 
You know, they don't put that in the statistics because they don't consider that preventable, I guess, or they don't say it's a disease, which, okay, I can, I can understand that. But you have to be realistic with the words and how uh, you frame the arguments because the left has done a great job of controlling the dialogue and the way things are framed and what they call the optics and the words used. And they co-opt the media and people think, oh, you know, I mean, it's just uh, they, they get the soft-headed people out there who only take one pass at an issue and, and they've made up their mind and they're done. So anyway, uh, uh, the guy in, uh, who died, I'm not going to mention his name. I'm not even going to give him the dignity of name, put his name out there. Uh, uh, long overdue. And, um, you know, if they ever asked me to say, well, would you, you know, put the needle in the guy's arm? You bet. Somebody like that, in my opinion, uh, has, for, like I said, forfeited their right to, to live, eat, and breathe. And uh, that's it. You know, you, you go kill two people like that. There's no reason you should be around. So, uh, n- Within uh, a week, we had on Virginia Ross last Friday, and she talked about early ballots are going out. So they should hit the mail next Friday, I think, or thereabouts, August 1st or maybe the day before, but they will they will be in the mail. And the elections in this state are pretty much decided in the first two weeks uh, after the mail ballots go out. So um, it's game over basically by August. Let's see here. Let me look at my little... Samsung S, uh, uh, da, 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 da. um, uh, yeah, by the, um, well, okay, it's not going to behave here. You know, it's technology, right? It's always a challenge. Um, normally by, by about the ninth, 16th or so, the, the it's actually elect, the election is technically over, even though we haven't had it, which is the date is the 26th. And what I mean by that is, People have uh, voted uh, by that time through the ballot and mailed them in. And as you heard Miss Ross last uh, last week talk about how they, they everything's counted, but no one knows what's in the results of the machines. They, they run them through the, the ballot counting system. So um, uh, then the night of the election, right at 7 o'clock or very closely thereafter, all those early ballots are counted, and it's extremely rare. That if a candidate is ahead on those early ballots that are released right at 7 o'clock, that they end up losing the election after all the walk-up ballots on the 26th uh, occur. So um, that's that's it, folks. So we're coming up. So it's very, very close to happening. And if you aren't paying attention and you do like to vote, now's the time. We do have a lot of the interviews posted on our website, kqcklive.com. You can look up. It's live TV shows. You can see Pinal Power Players. Go down the list and you can see your LD8, LD11. I haven't gotten to everybody. I'm hoping uh, TJ Shope and Frank Pratt will come on on the 15th if they're available. I'm hoping also maybe Christine Jones will come in and do a special interview with me before the election. Uh, She was scheduled to be on and then they canceled and we haven't been able to uh, connect up on a date. If people have questions for me, we've got a few minutes left in the show, about 10 minutes, and would like to go on the air, uh, 480-745-1033 is a call-in number. And uh, let me make sure I've got the microphone potted up for it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, if you have uh, a comment you'd like to make or add to the show, I've got some a few minutes left, 480-745-1033. And We'll just put you right on the air. We don't filter here. Um, we'll let you uh, make your opinion known on anything you'd like to talk about here on Friday afternoon. Now, if I don't sound as as astute and as sharp as I usually do, my apologies. Last night, about 9.53.30 seconds, my uh, air conditioning system in my house decided to Go, join the uh, the heavenly choir or the you know the it gone on to the uh, the other side of uh, of electrical heaven and i had no air conditioning last night so being it's the hottest time of the year in arizona this was a, this was kind of exciting uh, luckily we do have some neighbors who had some have a spare bedroom and we were able to go down and get a little bit of sleep and uh, today we are without it but here was the hottest day in the a history of Arizona, uh, and uh, you know, was pretty bad. 116, 
And so it was warm. Let's see here. Well, we might have a caller, but I'm not sure if it's calling in for the show. We'll see here. KQCK, are you, uh, KQCK Radio, you're on the air. Hey, Mr. Wolf, Mr. Roach. Oh, Chad Roach. Let me uh, fix this. I'd see if I got this exactly right. Hang on a second. All righty then. Chad Roach, our clerk of court, is on the line. Chad, give me a sound check here. Are you still there? Just call him a second. I was actually... You beat me to the punch. I was calling to see how your uh, air conditioning situation turned out last night. Well, it's a hot time in the old town tonight, as it were. But uh, uh, Chad is up for re-election in 2014. He has a primary opponent. Chad, tell us about how things are going with your campaign and what things you're talking about and what events you have coming up on, on your campaign schedule. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I, uh, well, the 31st, we have a, uh, there's a forum between myself and JP candidates and some LD candidates in Casa Grande the Lutheran Church. Uh, it'd be great to have people come out and hear some things and hear some great things that we've done. That's in Casa Grande. And, uh, what ni- what night is that, Chad? Uh, it's the thirty first. And that's a th- is that the Wednesday night that or is that a Thursday night? Um, you know, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I think it's I think it's a Thursday, Thursday night because normally they have the Casa Grande thing on Wednesday night, so it's a different night than. Oh, it's not the Western Pinal. It's what what group is it this time? Uh, it is actually the Tri Valley of the Castor Grim Dispatch is sponsoring it. Okay. So it's the newspaper. It is. It is. Okay. Uh, so it should be a pretty decent turnout of, of uh, civically minded individuals. And since I interrupted you, let's give out the location again. Uh, is that the Lutheran Church in Castor Grim? Do we have it? And a- uh, I, will, I will get you the exact address. I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, I have a couple probates in front of me. That's what I'm taking care of right now. But. Uh, you're actually working, I understand. What uh, is there? Is it just you and your opponent, or are there other candidates going to be there? There are other candidates. The, the two candidates for the Casa Grande Justice of the Peace Office are going to be there, and uh, there will be a slate of legislative candidates. Uh, I believe it is LD16 or LD8. I forget which one it is. Um, they'll be out there. All right. Well, uh, so that's an event you'll be at. Uh, do you have any? Uh, it is. Yeah, take. And, you know, I actually called in to let the listener, your listeners, know about the great educational forum we had last night at uh, Post and Butte High School. Yes, I had and, to miss uh, that. So, yeah, tell us about it. Well, it was great. I tell you what, the the, the principal uh, Tim at Post and Butte talked about how uh, the Florence Unified School District, even though they've had their funding reduced year after year after year after year. Results have gotten better and better and better, and they're turning out smarter, brighter kids. They're getting better grades. And he says uh, it was kind of refreshing to hear uh, the principal of a school say money isn't the only solution. We need leadership. Uh, just like uh, candidate Doug Ducey just said. <laughs> if you happen to <laughs> I listen to him. That. I did. I'm sure you were working and you missed that. Important. Yeah, it's, well, it's the, it is the key because it all starts at the top. And as an ex-Navy man, you know better than I that uh, – it really matters what the captain of the ship has and the attitude he brings to the situation that that the whole the whole attitude of the crew is determined by the leadership. You better believe it. Well, uh, where 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 were you? Uh, what ship were, were you on? A ship? I don't even know if you're ever deployed. Can you tell us about a little bit about your Navy background? Yeah, well, I was an operations specialist and tactical air controller, uh, and I served on board the USS John L. Hall, which was a uh, a frigate which, uh, believe it or not, the frigate class of ships is going to be officially decommissioned by the United States Navy, even though the USS Constitution, one of our first ships, was a frigate. The U.S. Navy, for the first time in history, will have no frigates. Uh, for those of us who are not uh, salt, salty dogs, what, is the, what, de- <laughs> what determines a frigate as, as opposed to a battleship? Uh, well, a frigate is about the size of the lifeboat for a battleship. So uh, a frigate is about a 144-foot uh, ship. It's about the size of a big Coast Guard cutter. So it's the smallest ship in the warship in the Navy. And its job, in the, or what's its role? What do, what do they play? Are they supply ships, or what do they do? Well, the official response is that they, they lead the fleet. They go out in advance of the fleet and research, I mean, uh, search for submarines or other targets. Um, but those of us who served on them referred to, the, to them very endearingly as missile sponges for the fleet. Okay, so you kind of could, you you know, okay, I got you. You walked through the minefields first. Yes, we would go in advance of the fleet and uh, search for submarines or other aircraft or uh, other ships that could potentially harm the 
battleships, the cruisers, the destroyers, and the air, especially the aircraft carriers. I see. So, uh, so the, oh, really? So the USS Constitution, it was a frigate, but it didn't play that role back 200 years ago. It must have done something different, even though it was the same class of ship. Correct, yes. It was, it was much more of a flagship type ship. Okay. Well, I, you know, that, that uh, interesting. I didn't, I, you know, I don't know much about that, that sort of thing. So you served in the Navy, got your MBA, I believe, and then ran for clerk of the court. What year was that? That was in 2010. 2010. So it's a four year term. And that was kind of a wave election for Republicans, wouldn't you say? I was, I'm the uh, second countywide Republican ever elected behind the sheriff. And then uh, I'm the only Republican to ever hold the office of the clerk in the county's history. And uh, is the sheriff supporting you, uh, Sheriff Paul Babu, on this time around? Absolutely. He's endorsed me. Um, his PAC has, has helped me out financially, um, and he has uh, definitely committed his support to, to my reelection. And who else in the county is supporting you besides me? Oh, <laughs> I would say our esteemed county assessor. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I do have the endorsement and support of, of Chairman Tony Smith, the chairman of the Board of Supervisors. And uh, there is another endorsement coming today from one of the other supervisors on the board who shall at this time remain nameless, but it will be released uh, later today. Okay. Well, Chad, thank you for calling in. Uh, how can people find you on the Internet if they want to find out more about your campaign? Uh, it's very simple. It's www chadroach.com and it's r-o-c-h-e chadroach.com all right well thanks for calling in enjoyed having you as as a guest and uh good luck next week when the ballots go out thank you sir appreciate it thanks for the show great show there you are folks live uh real unrehearsed radio our uh, clerk of courts who's running in 2014 if anyone wants to call in who uh is interested in that race we have a few minutes left and you're welcome to join us and the number to call is 480-745-1033. And actually, this, I'm very excited because this is the first time in quite a while that we've ex- actually had um, interactive with our phone system. We've, you know, As you know, I like to do callers, and we've had uh, a lot of uh, technical upgrades here at the station. And then when we get a lot of rain, sometimes you know it's tough out here because the monsoons are difficult with our tech, uh, not with the technology, but with the infrastructure. Because we are out here at Compound Carrero, and sometimes we run into difficulties. Oop, let me see if I can get that to shut off here. And of course, we have a host who sometimes has some problems running the equipment too. So um, next week again, I told you uh, uh, we're going to have the state treasurer candidate Jeff Dewitt. The week after. Diane Douglas, and the 15th right now, hopefully TJ and uh, Frank Pratt, or one or both, will come on and talk about uh, their election. They're running an LD8, and uh, or we may get a surprise guest. We're not sure yet because we haven't booked it for sure. The week um, the week after the election, uh, the 20, I think it's the 29th of August, Fred Duvall has committed to be on. Fred is the Democratic candidate. And as you know, I generally uh, ha- attract Republican candidates and, and guests, but uh, I'd like to give Mr. Duvall an opportunity to tell us why he would do a better job as the Democrat uh, running the state of Arizona if he were to be elected. I, I think he's got a tough row to hoe to get there, but um, then again, uh, I could be wrong, and uh, it'd be fun to hear what he has to say, and I'm sure uh, our listeners out there would have lots of questions for him, and with any luck, we'll have that all going um, very smoothly by the end of the uh, end of the month. But next week, Jeff DeWitt, I am Douglas Wolf, your uh, Pinal County Assessor and host of Pinal Power Players. I want to thank you for listening in today here all around Pinal County, Arizona, the United States, and to our sister station in Costa Rica, Costa Rica. Um, where we have a a very lively audience down there. Welcome, and thank you for listening in. And let me um, get my outro going, and I will say goodbye, and God bless America, and, and God bless Pinal County. I hope you enjoyed today's show, where you can always expect to hear the top local, national, international politicians, and celebrity guests. KQCK Radio, radio worth watching. 
More Pet Supplies has been the leading online source for pet doors and premium pet supplies since 1996. Take advantage of their product experts for all types of pet doors and installation options. Their friendly, knowledgeable consultants can recommend several options that work for your unique situation. They will ensure that you receive the best pet door to meet your expectations and budget. Whether you need a pet door installed through walls, doors, French doors, sliding glass doors, custom-made sizes, or through glass models, no one offers more choices. More Pet Supplies is also your source for the popular pet doors made by Security Boss Manufacturing, makers of the best pet doors on the market. Check them out now online at www.morepet.com. That's www.moorepet.com. Or call them toll free at 1-800-829-7876. Give yourself and your pet the freedom. More Pet Supplies and Security Boss Products. Again, that's morepet.com. www.moorepet.com.